Baby, don't make me spell it out for ya. All of the feelings that I've got for ya. Can't be explained, but I can try for ya. Yeah, baby, don't make me spell it out for ya. You keep on asking me the same questions. Why? And second guessing all my intentions. Should know by the way I use my compression. That you got the answers to my confessions. It's like I'm powerful with a little bit of tender and emotion. No, 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 Mess me up, yeah, but no one does it better. There's nothing better. That's just the way you make me feel. 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 Uh huh. So good, so good, so good, so real. Uh huh. That's just the way you make me feel. That's just the way you make me feel. That's just the way you make me feel. You know I love you so, please don't stop it. Let's go get ahead and get started. Hi, welcome everyone. It's great to see you all. Uh, we are excited you are joining us to our October Collaboratory, Centering Black, Queer, and Trans Birth. We are intentionally hosting this event at the end of October to call attention to Transgender Awareness Week in the month of November. My name is Bobby Abilo, and I am a budding pre-health professional, a health advocate, and a community advisory board member of the Preterm Birth Initiative who helped imagine this event. If this is your first event with the California Preterm Birth Initiative, we welcome you to join us every month at our collaboratory series to think through and generate new ideas, collaborations, and innovative approaches to preventing preterm birth delivery and improving outcomes for babies born too soon. This month, um, our, trans, our organizational highlight is a San Francisco organization, the Transgender District, which was founded by three Black trans women in 2017 and is the first legally recognized transgender district in the world. The mission of the Transgender District is to create an urban environment that fosters the rich history, culture, legacy, and empowerment of transgender people and its deep roots in the Southeastern Tenderloin neighborhood. They aim to stabilize and economically empower the transgender community through ownership of homes, businesses, historic and cultural sites, and safe community spaces. If you wanna learn more or donate to their cause, you can at transgenderdistrictsf.com and that will be below in the chat. For our agenda today, we are going to hear from Pride Med student leaders, Ali and Jay, to give a brief background on the importance of contesting racism and cis normativity in medical education. For our keynote, Caden Coleman will be presenting on Black trans masculine fertility and birth. Caden is a Black transgender man who has carried and given birth to two daughters and is one of very few Black transgender men who have done so publicly. Caden has dedicated his life to advocating for transgender people in medical spaces. He hopes that through education, he can assist in erasing the trauma and disparities that trans people face when seeking medical care. Next, we will be hosting a fireside chat with Ajira Darch and King Yaw. Ajira is a queer, flat, sorry, queer, fat, black mama of two. She is passionate about parenting and connecting and building community. These passions and all she's learned through them inform and guide her work as a full spectrum birth worker, never flat, let's get that clear. Um, a full spectrum birth worker, podcast host, ceremony facilitator, and birth and branding photographer. King is an intersectional feminist and their work centers the well being of queer, trans, and non binary folks through full spectrum support, somatic sex and pleasure coaching and gender affirming transitioning companionship. They also train intentional health and wellness practitioners on developing the competencies to care for and to create safer and inclusive practices for queer, trans and gender diverse people. They are invested in decolonizing health and queering up reproductive justice, as well as the collective healing and liberation of queer, trans and non-binary folks, especially BIPOC folks. 
We will have some time for your questions throughout the session. So please utilize the Q&A function on Zoom throughout this event if you would like to ask questions. Finally, before we begin, we wanna share huge gratitude to our partners and sponsors for investing into this event. Thank you to the UCSF LGBTQ Resource Center, the Community Engagement Research Incubator and Strategy Hub, Sarish, and UCSF Pride in Medicine. We also, want to, we also want to thank some of the many people who provided input into this session, including our speakers, Ajira Darch, PTBI staff, JJ, Rhea, and Selena, LGBTQ Resource Center leaders, Clint and Tracy, and Pride, Mem Pride Med members. To kick us off, I want to introduce Tracy Garcia, the Assistant Director of the UCSF LGBTQ Resource Center. Thank you, Bobby, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Again, my name is Tracy Garcia. My pronouns are she and they, and I am the Assistant Director of the LGBTQ Research Center at UCSF. We're very excited to partner with Preterm Birth Initiative on this collaboratory. Uh, today's event is an opportunity to expand and recenter conversations around birth and birthing people to include LGBTQ people and to specifically uplift our Black, trans, and queer communities. It's so important to address the need for affirming care that truly includes the complexities of these lived experiences. So I'm very excited to hear from our guest speakers today. And now I'd like to introduce Ali and Jay, who are student leaders that have been working to increase inclusivity in the med school curriculum through their organization, Pride Med. Hi all, uh, so my name is Jay Zussman, my pronouns are they, them, and this is my colleague Ali, who will be presenting with me today. Um, we are both representatives of UCSF Pride in Medicine, which is an LGBTQIA plus medicine focused uh, student organization here at the UCSF School of Medicine. We're gonna get started by sharing a few thoughts on how to center black, queer, and trans voices to improve medical education and showcase some of our own efforts for improved gender and sex inclusivity in the UCSF School of Medicine curriculum. First of all, Western medicine has actively perpetuated harmful sex binaries and cisnormativity throughout history, and it continues to have an active role in enforcing these structures. For folks who might not yet be familiar with uh, the idea of binary sex, but it's been commonly enforced by the medical system to categorize patients as exclusively either male or female, uh, intentionally to make it seem like other expressions of human sex don't exist, which they certainly do. And cisnormativity is uh, the idea of that cisgender people uh, and experiences are the default norm and that trans, non-binary, gender expansive people who don't fit within those norms are aberrant. Uh, terms that refer to gender and sex have been used historically with really variable and imprecise definitions in medicine to erase trans, non-binary, and intersex people. And trainees and educators uh, should be actively involved in modifying clinical language to better encompass the diversity all around us. So, you know, we're here talking about why inclusivity is important. There's so many reasons, but some of the main ones that we thought of were that trainees are going to encounter patients with diverse and marginalized gender and sex identities and must learn how to provide affirming care to all. Microaggressions from uninformed healthcare providers against these patients can lead to adverse health, health outcomes. So patients want and need care that's sensitive and affirming for optimal health outcomes. From personal experience as a UCSF medical student, today's trainees are motivated to learn how, pro how to provide care that's sensitive and affirming. And we need to center intersectional marginalized voices in our collective efforts to improve medical education and practice. Events like today's talk are an important step towards centering black, queer, and trans voices to deepen our community's understanding of reproductive health and justice. Medical educators must take the time to learn from experts in queer, trans, and intersex health before educating health trainees. So thank you to all medical educators who are in attendance today. The fact that you're here learning from queer and trans experts on how to provide affirming care will not be lost on your students. Please carry forward the lessons you learned today. Your students want to hear. Now we would love to introduce our keynote speaker, Caden Coleman for his presentation, Black Transmasculine Fertility and Birth, which will highlight his unique intersectional experiences as a Black transmasculine dad. Thanks everyone. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm gonna apologize in advance because there's two things happening right now over in my way. Um, there's crazy wind. So if my 
internet, my power keeps going in and out. So if that happens, I, I'm so sorry. I'm gonna just hope that it doesn't happen um, again, cause it's been happening all day. Also, they just decided that they were going to cut down trees outside my apartment. So that's also a thing. So if it's loud, I really apologize. I'm hoping that they're done. It sounds like they're done. We're just gonna keep our fingers crossed on that. Um, but thank you guys so much for having me. Um, I am going to share my screen. So I'm gonna jump around a little bit. Um, first and foremost, if you can hear me, please give me a thumbs up because my AirPods act crazy every once in a while. So I just wanna make sure everybody can hear me. Okay, great, beautiful. <clears throat> so I'm just gonna introduce myself really quick even though you guys already got my bio. I just wanna show my picture and be cute for a moment. So who am I? Uh, my name is Caden Coleman. My pronouns are he, him. Um, and I self-identified myself by accident as Papa Seahorse and that's who I am now. Um, I am a father of two daughters. I have a um, 15 month old journey and a seven year old Azalea um, who I gave birth to uh, both of them following uh, beginning my transition way back in the dark ages over a decade ago. Um, I am a black gay transgender man. Um, I am a trans advocate, educator, um, consultant, um, you know, self-proclaimed comedian, all the good things. Um, I, we're not gonna do the what to expect because this is not a full workshop. I am literally using my workshop slides here because I want you guys to see what I would normally present. So today what we're gonna talk about is the black trans masculine experience, right? Um, I'm gonna start off actually by giving you just kind of a little snippet of my, one of my birth stories um, because my birth story differs very much from that of your typical birth story, and by typical, I mean white, um, trans <laughs> masculine birth story. Um, and so therefore I thought it was really important, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen, um, to, for you guys to understand kind of what my experience looked like. Um, so quickly, a little background, I began transitioning socially back in 2008, 2009, and I began um, physically transitioning in 2009, 2010-ish. Um, <clears throat> And in March of 2013, um, I had my top surgery, double mastectomy uh, with nipple grafts. Um, my surgeon, Dr. Medali in Cleveland, Ohio, um, suggested, well, didn't suggest, he told me I needed to stop taking testosterone for six weeks prior to my surgery, um, which I recently found out by doing my own research that there's literally no reason why that's a thing. It just kind of is. Um, and so I didn't care at the time. I was just really excited to um, be having surgery. And uh, I was like, okay, fine. So I stopped taking my, my hormones for six weeks prior to surgery. I was always pretty horrible at taking, at keeping up with my shot. Um, it's funny when you start transitioning, it's like, you can't even wait the whole week. You're like, I have to get these changes. So you're like, waiting to take your testosterone. And then after like a year or so, it's just kind of like, okay, they're here and needle anxiety and all that good stuff. So um, I stopped taking my, my uh, hormones. I had my surgery, um, you know, my chest was free. I'm out here living my very best life, my very best life, celebrating my birthday, going out, getting drunk and, going to Six Flags, doing all the good things, right? Because it's summertime, it's hot. I have every reason to have my shirt off, you know. Um, so fast forward to somewhere around August, September time. Um, <laughs> I'm getting fat and a little well, fatter and I don't know why. I'm in the gym, I'm working out, I'm changing my diet, I'm eating right, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing and still I'm gaining this weight. Um, so I'm like in and out of the doctor, you know, kind of like what's going on kind of thing. Um, I'm fatigued, crazy tired, like crazy, crazy tired. And I had thyroid issues at the time. So we thought it was that. Check my thyroid. My thyroid was fine. Um, I also, um, diabetes runs in my family. So at some point I had to pee all the time, all the time I had to pee. So I'm like, oh my God, I have diabetes. 
check my blood sugar, diabetes, no, no diabetes, my blood sugar was fine. They're basically like, Kaden, there's nothing wrong with you. And I'm like, okay, but there's something wrong with me. I know something is off. Um, so one day I was working in retail at the time. And one day I, my back was killing me, went home um, to my ex-husband. Um, and I was like, hey, do you think you'd give me a massage? Of course he was like, yes. And I laid down on the bed, you know, to get my massage. And I don't know, it felt like there was like, the sheet was like bunched up under my stomach. And I'm like, what is going on? So I get up, I smooth out the sheets, um, lay back down, that feeling's still there. I'm like, half joking to him. I'm like, you know, maybe we should get a pregnancy test. He's like, yeah, whatever, okay. Runs up to the, to the um, CVS up the street comes back, hands it to me, um, and I go in the restroom and I pee on the stick. And I'm like, trying to make sure I'm reading this correctly and um, you're gonna have to excuse my French, but this is what I said verbatim. I opened the door, I looked at him and I said, Elijah, we are so fucked. And he jumped up and he was like, what, what? Um, and, you know, obviously it said I was pregnant and um, I didn't believe it because I was always told that once I started testosterone, it's after a certain amount of time being on testosterone that, you know, it would render me infertile. I wasn't going to be able to have kids. So I'm like, this has to be wrong. Obviously, this pregnancy test is defective. So we went across town to um, Olive Garden and had our endless breadsticks and salad. And <laughs> we went to the CVS over there. It was like 30 minutes away, uh, 20, 30 minutes from our house or whatever the case may be. And um, we went to, after that, we went to another pharmacy and um, I didn't even leave. I didn't even leave. I went to the bathroom there um, and, you know, peed on the stick, obviously came back pregnant. Didn't believe that, went and got some digital tests, um, you know, the two pack with the digital test and the regular test. I peed on both of them at the same time, came back immediately pregnant. So I go to the doctor, we're, we're okay, pregnant, cool. We're like talking about it, couldn't be more than like a month, maybe a month and a half, right? So we go to the, to the doctor's office and the doctor's like feeling my stomach and he goes, um, yeah, you're probably about 21 weeks. And I'm like, wait a minute. 21 divided by four. So you're telling me I'm five months. Okay, cool. Great. All right. <clears throat> so we, um, my, my doctor, my primary care um, physician was at an LGBT um, clinic in Philadelphia. And, um, you know, in retrospect, it doesn't make sense that they didn't think to check um, to see if I was pregnant, um, but you know we were here, so I was like, okay, you know, I'm having a baby. Cool. Um, I'm thinking to myself, I can trust, you know, uh, this place to send me somewhere that is, at the very least, LGBT competent. They did not. Um, I spent the rest of the months of my pregnancy basically being misgendered. Um, I had to change my gender marker from male to female for insurance purposes, otherwise they kept denying my um, claims. Um, and, uh, you know, it was a lot of just fighting for basic things, like asking them, hey, can you, yes, I know I'm at the OB's office. It's not a secret. They didn't make a mistake. Um, <clears throat> When it was time for me to give birth, I had a uh, preeclampsia. So they were like, come in, we're gonna induce you. Um, the first thing I did when I walked in is I was like, hey, um, you know, happy to be here, um, <laughs> but do you think it's possible that I could get a C-section because I just don't see myself pushing anything. Mm, I, that's just not in my ministry. It's just not how I'm feeling about myself. Um, that lady looked at me and said, um, no, um, you can't have a C-section because 
all of the women on the labor and delivery floor uh, prefer to have natural births. So I didn't know at the time that, you know, it's my body and I have full autonomy over it. Um, and um, they proceeded to induce me um, over the next five days. Now, to be clear, I was, I uh, had preeclampsia. So I was on a magnesium drip, which means that I couldn't get in and out of bed. I was bedridden for five days on a liquid diet. Um, the preeclampsia made um, my body swell. I have sleep apnea, so I wasn't, I couldn't sleep because I would stop breathing. Um, I couldn't get up and use the restroom. I had to pee in a bedpan and poop in a commode. Um, it was, it was horrible. Um, I got to the point of on day five, the doctor comes in and she's like, yeah, we're going to um, go ahead and do the Pitocin again. Um, which is a pill they put in your cheek. And basically they were starting the process over. <laughs> and I let her walk out of the room and I looked at my ex-husband and I was like, no, go get the doctor. I had enough. Um, I called her back in the room and I said, um, I know that all of the women on this floor would prefer natural birth. And to be clear, C-section is natural as well, whatever. Um, um, but I don't know if you noticed, I'm not all of the women on this floor. And I was like, at this point, either you're gonna cut this baby out or I'm gonna cut this baby out. And 30 minutes later, I was having a C-section. Um, unfortunately, however, that trauma, um, there, the trauma was done. Um, I correlated that traumatic experience to my daughter. I was diagnosed with postpartum depression, PTSD and anxiety. I was extremely, extremely, extremely suicidal um, for the first year, year and a half uh, postpartum. Um, I had no support. I had no one. There was no, there were groups. There were groups for transmasculine parents, but they were all white. I had no one like myself to turn to. Um, and in retrospect, I, there's a lot of things that contributed to um, my experience, um, things that are in place, right? Um, it, one, um, it was negligence on behalf of uh, my primary care to not give me a pregnancy test, knowing that I had not had a hysterectomy, knowing that I was having sex with um, cis a cisgender man, unprotected because we were married. Um, <clears throat> he never thought to um, administer a pregnancy test. And as someone who has navigated life as perceived a cisgender um, woman, um, I know that when, when women, cis women go into the doctor's office, even if it's just because they stubbed their toe, they always are asked, um, is it a possibility you could be pregnant or you know, would you like a pregnancy test or something to that effect? And they dropped the ball heavily um, in that vein for me. Um, beyond that, however, um, I was low income, you know, living in the inner city as a black person. Um, when, I was, when I found out I was pregnant, um, I qualified for Medicaid. Um, and, you know, I didn't have very many choices in the matter of care um, and things of that nature. So when we hear about like the stories of white trans masculine people, um, oftentimes in those stories, they became pregnant through IVF. It was a planned pregnancy normally. Um, you know, they're having these beautiful
Hey everyone, it looks like we're experiencing some technical difficulties. So sorry about that. Um, we're going to see if Caden's um, situation comes back online. We all know that he mentioned that he's experiencing some technical difficulties. Um, but in the meantime, um, I'm wondering if we want to maybe move towards the fireside chat. Um, but maybe we'll give it a couple minutes. Um, so let's give it two minutes. Um, and then perhaps we can maybe invite King and Ajira if you're ready to go while we wait for Caden to come back online. Sounds good. Laying your body on the shag carpet. Oh, you know I love it, so please don't stop it. It's like I'm powerful with a little bit of tender and emotion. No, no, Mess me up, yeah, but no one does it better. There's nothing better. No. That's just the way you make me feel. Oh my goodness. I was like, no. Okay. I'm, I'm here. I'm sorry, guys. Um, okay. Of course, I forget where I was at. Um, oh, talking about <clears throat> basically where they dropped the ball. Um, so, you know, where I had is is basically slim to none. Um, you know, it's it's not it's not it's very unlikely that you'll find competent care um, using Medicaid, right? Um, but beyond that, let's 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 delve into it a bit. Um, when we talk about microaggressions and anti-blackness and things of that nature, um, I, I want to make, I want to share my screen. Um, okay, um, if you can see my screen, please give me a thumbs up or, you know, some form of, there we go, perfect. All right, so this is an important, um, information, right? Um, according to the CDC, Black American or Black American Indian and um, Alaska Native 
women are two to three times more likely to die from pregnancy related causes than white women. And this disparity increases with age. However, there's no data surrounding the treatment of black trans masculine folks, right? So if you consider it, um, when we think about microaggressions and things of that nature, um, there's a reason why minorities, and we're gonna just stick to black people for right now because I stay in my lane, right? Um, there's a reason why black people die at such a disproportionate amount in relation to white people, right? Um, when black people um, enter medical spaces, um, there's a high chance that we are not taken seriously or listened to. Add trans on top of that and the focus becomes being black and trans and not what we are there for right we don't where our our issues are not being taken into account there's been many times when um i've gone in for one thing and my entire visit has turned into this like trans question q a kind of thing right um or they spend most of the time trying to gauge our level of um, whether or not we're mentally ill or not, yeah? Um, if I were white in that space and I walked into that, um, into the labor and delivery floor and said, hey, you know, I want a C-section. Of course, this is a hypothetical. But the data and the proof is out there, right? That there's a higher chance that if I were white, especially if I were white perceived male, even being on the labor and delivery floor, think of it this way. Um, when a black man walks into a room filled with predominantly white people, oftentimes that black person is seen as a threat regardless of whether or not I'm being misgendered, regardless of whether or not I'm pregnant, regardless of whether or not they're like, oh, this used to be a female. When I walk into a room, the perception is reality, right? So the first thing they see is black man, right? I am automatically perceived to be a threat. Whereas white men, when a white man walks into a room, he is, no, he is not seen as a threat at all, right? Also, there's a level of respect that happens. People are more inclined to listen to white men. So if I walked in and I perceived white male and I'm saying, this is what I want, there is a much higher chance that I will be listened to. Am I making sense? Um, really quickly, I wanna get into, um, this isn't actually my story, but it is important information. I um, interviewed two transmasculine people, um, M who is black, uh, B who is white. They're very similar in age, um, very similar in how, how long they were on testosterone for. Um, the only real differences here is that obviously they're different people, but one is white, one is black. And I asked them about their um, experiences because I did not want to center it solely around my experience like, oh, I went through all this trauma, so this is, must be what um, Black people go through. I wanted to see it from the vein of someone else, right? Um, I'm not going to get too much into the, to the data part of it, right? But what I will say is M um, had more health issues during his pregnancy. Why? Because M is Black and low income. In black low income areas, access to healthy foods, access to those types of resources are a lot harder to obtain, right? Um, I know M had a, um, a bleeding issue. I won't go into terminology, but he, he had a bleeding issue, went into the ER because of it. And instead of getting that issue addressed, they, asked him about his mental, um, his mental stability and basically would not let him leave the hospital until he promised to seek therapy. They never addressed his health issue. 
He didn't feel in control. He also had to have a C-section. B, the white man felt in full control. He also had a midwife that was provided with his medical insurance. His pregnancy was planned. M's pregnancy was not planned. Um, and he had a water birth. <laughs> this is not coincidental. This is not, this is not something, this is not a one-off. This is not, um, I, I, beyond people like M, I just had another friend who gave, who had a C-section um, two months early. His baby is still in the hospital and she was born like a month ago. Um, and throughout his pregnancy, he was contacting me, dealing with all these microaggressions, asking me how, how you know, I navigated these things. Um, I don't get those same types of questions from white trans masculine people. Yes, there's the occasional, oh, I got misgendered at the hospital, but there aren't these microaggressions that are happening. It's what we have to recognize is um, the health system is based off of white supremacy, right? Um, there are just things in place that are meant to keep us where we are. Um, and I see that comment, Marcia, um, they are not microaggressions. I refer to them as microaggressions, but they're very macro. Right. Um, it's really important to understand that the black trans masculine experience is not that of the white trans masculine experience. That's basically what my story is here for you today. Right. Um, the media is very whitewashed. Right. There are black trans masculine people out here having babies. It's not just white people, but even if you, I, I do this in my workshop, and if you have the access to, um, I would like for you to just really quickly go to Google and type in um, black pregnant transgender man. And whoever can do it quickly, quick, quickly, if you can tell me who pops up when you Google that, you can just write it in the chat. Um, and what happens as you begin to scroll through, you, what, what happens as you, begin to scroll. So, and then when you go to the Google, I want you to also go into images, click the images tab. Thank you, a lot of trauma. Um, and the images turn very white very quickly. It's me, Miles, a sprinkle of like other people, and then white, 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 white. That's not by, that's not by accident, y'all. The white trans masculine experience is just more palatable because they're white, right? Um, they're more palatable because it's these, it's these stories of triumph and bravery. And oftentimes there's the, the white, and I'm not here to diminish the white, white trans masculine people. Like I have a lot of colleagues and, and friends who are white trans masculine parents that we have conversations about parenting and things like that all of the time. But facts are facts. These people are, are surrounded by their grandparents and their, and their community. And you know they're not hurting for money. You're, they're not out here scratching and surviving, hanging in and diving just trying to you know, get their rent paid. They're living on farms and buying vehicles and own their homes and probably have great credit and things of that nature. But us as black trans masculine people, I'm not saying we don't exist where there are people who are owning their homes and things of that nature. However, the, 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 the odds of that are, are very low. They're very, they're very low because why systematic racism? Um, it's just very important to note to, um, to note that, you know, visibility for black trans masculine people is what is going to save our lives. Honestly, 
even with my postpartum care, because it really wasn't that, um, I went in and I told them about how I was feeling suicidal and they basically just tried to throw antidepressants at me. Um, and they were just like, hey, you know, take this pill. You might never have an orgasm again, but it's okay. That was, that was my postpartum care. If it wasn't for me and just being determined not to die, I wouldn't be sitting here right now. Um, and this is, this, is, this is the story of so many people. My friend who I just told you who had a baby two, uh, a month ago was in my inbox telling me how he has no care and how depressed he is. And I had to let him know like, please don't ignore this. Please don't ignore this. If you need me to talk to, talk to me. But you cannot ignore this and do not let people just throw antidepressants at you because he also is on Medicaid. They don't care about our black bodies. Um, so just really quickly, I'm gonna, just gonna talk about um, allyship. Um, and normally this is the conversation, right? Um, what does allyship mean to you? Um, so allyship is, is what we need. <laughs> um, there's one thing to come and, and hear our story and you know empathize and say how horrible it is. Um, but the reason I share my story isn't because I need empathy. It's not because I need anybody to feel sorry for me. It's not because I enjoy reliving this trauma and it's fun for me. It's because I need for people to want to be allies. I need for people to want to incite change. I need it so that people, I'm not having any more kids. I'd rather walk in the traffic. However, there are people like myself who are going to have kids who should be able to experience that joy and it actually be joyful, right? So allyship, the first thing I have to say is allyship um, is a verb. It goes beyond coming to um, a workshop. It, what, it, what it is is uplifting black trans masculine people, black trans people as a whole, black people. <laughs> um, and what, what do I mean by uplifting? I don't mean just following them on Instagram and liking their pictures. I mean paying them for their words and their time, um, listening to our stories, um, donating to organizations or straight to black people, reparations, right? Um, but the biggest way to be an ally is through education. It is so important. Education is most important um okay so to be clear um about this whole situation is the it's so windy here that my um cell phone service isn't even working my phone is not working at all unless it's um unless it's on wi-fi and my wi-fi keeps going out because my electricity keeps going out so that's that's where we're at right now um um, okay, <laughs> I um, just wanna talk about education really quick and then I'm gonna get out of you guys' hair with me and my technical difficulties here. Um, education is the biggest way to, to be an ally, right? Um, you, can, you can have the desire to be an ally, but if you're not educating yourself on transness and trans experiences, um, or if you're, educating yourself um, through cisgender folks, um, then your, your, your allyship is, 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 is not where it needs to be. Um, the best experience, the, the best teacher in my experience is 
lived experience, especially when they were talking about um, like things like transmasculine birth and fertility, right? There are so many providers out here providing inaccurate um, information. Um, there's a lot of cisgender folks out here who aren't providers also providing um, inaccurate information. Um, and the problem here is in the transmasculine community, um, we're often very, very, very invisible. And what I mean by that is we're not included in studies. We're lumped in with cisgender women. And, you know, though body parts may be the same, that's not conducive to anyone's anything. Um, I've had to unlearn all of the things I was taught <laughs> by my providers. Um, so your education needs to come from trans people. Your education needs to come from the people who are actually living this life. Um, and it needs to be continue, continuing. Um, because not all trans masculine people are the same. Not all trans masculine people or experiences are the same as I just showed you with the, with, even when it comes to being white and being black and trans, um, that our identities intersect. I'm gay and trans, there's straight and trans, there's pan and there's non-binary. Um, there's so many different two-spirited, there's a whole plethora of identities under just even talking the trans masculine spectrum, right? Um, we haven't touched the trans feminine, we haven't touched the umbrella. Um, so that, that education needs to be continuing all the time. The most important thing I'm going to point out here is you should, as an ally, you should never be educating yourself at the expense of trans people, especially at the expense of black trans people. What do I mean by that? Pay trans people to educate you. Um, everybody is deserving of equity and inclusion. Um, and we don't owe you our stories, but we are owed equity and inclusion. And the only way, again, is to be educated. Um, I'm gonna just leave it there. <laughs> I'm gonna leave it there because it's getting super windy out here and I really don't want to um, get knocked off again. So I know we are supposed to be doing a Q and A um, portion of things. Um, I don't know who's orchestrating that, but. That'll be myself and Bobby. Thank you so much, Kaden, for sharing your story. Absolutely. Uh, I know folks oh, before are, we, oh yeah. Before go ahead. we before we go, before we do that, um, I don't know if this information was conveyed. And I'm just going to um just without any shame in my spirit, um I'm trying to crowdsource for me to be able to offer my um workshops, my trainings. Um, with uh, UCSF, um, uh, with CME credits, um, and that costs money, and I'm Black, and I'm poor, so I am crowdsourcing for that. I'm going to go ahead and put my information in the chat for anybody who would like to uh, contribute. I do not have a GoFundMe or anything like that set up because they're crooks and I'm not paying for crowdsourcing and that's not happening. Um, but I am gonna put a few different ways that you can contribute to that because I think that it is absolutely necessary. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to say that really quick before we went into that. Literally no shame here. <laughs> no, yeah, absolutely. Folks were asking for your Venmo, so they're definitely trying to show some love. Yes, love you all so much. Okay, let's do this Q and A before I run out of okay. electricity here. <laughs> awesome. So um, we do want to give folks a couple of minutes minutes to ask any clarifying questions. You can use the raise hand function if you want to ask your question, and we can unmute you. Otherwise, please type out your question via the Q and A function at the bottom of your Zoom window. And um, I can start us off. We do have a question um, from our medical students. Uh, Kaden, what advice would you give to medical students and providers uh, who are here on the call 
to help them make future interactions with trans patients more affirming and positive? Um, I'm gonna go back down the education vein. Um, what I would say is honestly, as a student, um, advocate to have, I know that lately of what I've, what I've been hearing, um, there's like very baseline grazings of talking about transness in some medical schools. Um, but actually advocating for that to be an actual topic, right? It should be, it, it should be being taught. Um, trans people exist regardless of how small our community is. And it's something as a medical professional, you should have at least, at least baseline education on as far as, you know, terminologies and things of that nature. And then beyond that, as you transition into whatever position career you transition into, that education should be continued. I think it should be a requirement of anyone providing any form of um, service medically to a person's body, <laughs> um, they should know about transness. I, in other words, there should never be a moment that I walk into a room and I should be teaching my doctor who I'm trusting with my body how to refer to me, right? Um, so advocating for, I don't know how, how you know, school politics works and, thing, and things of that nature, but advocating to have that put into the curriculum some way, somehow, by a trans person, that's important. We don't want professor, um, cisgender, 75-year-old Thompson, white, teaching about transness, right? The same way she shouldn't be teaching about blackness. Awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, there is a question here from Isaac. Hi, Isaac. Um, Isaac says, in your opinion, what research do you think is most vital to focus on when it comes to trans mask people and reproductive justice? And then they also share more info. They're involved with um, Gender Justice LA and the mm -hmm. shared contact info for you. I can okay. Um, so in all honesty, when it comes to research um, and transness, I couldn't even pick out one specific target item that needs, because literally we are left out of everything. And the only research that I've seen, research that I've seen um, was publicated in AWON. I don't know if you guys are familiar with AWON, A-W-H-O-N-N. -N. It's a medical publication. Um, and it's literally only provided to medical professionals. And they did, um, they did a research study on transmasculine fertility and birth. And someone who was, who, you know, has attended one of my workshops, sent it to, over to me so excited. And I see, I'm like, oh, this is great. Funny that I haven't heard of any research like this. And I was like, well, who wrote it? Middle-aged cisgender white woman. I'm like, okay, so what trans people did she include in this, in this research to come up with these conclusions? She didn't. Um, what's important is starting at the very bottom baseline things, getting together trans masculine people, having, you know, trans, you know, pertinent questions and answers included, and then putting that information out. Um, I, I don't have a specific topic. We need to be included. There needs to be research surrounding so many things medically when it comes to trans masculine people. Um, I just, the only thing I can really say is that in this research, there needs to be trans masculine people involved. That's the, that's the, that's the, at the bare, the bare basics of it. Awesome, thank you. And I think we have time for one more question. Bobby, did you have a, a suggestion for a question? I do see someone with their hand raised in the chat, Della Nederos. Um, 
Oh, I so apologize. I was um, having some difficulties with my technology earlier and I wasn't quite sure how to get the hand up or the hand down or what you were asking for thumbs up and I was in the totally in the wrong place. But Kate, I just want to, I, I, I just want to thank you just so much for sharing your story. I just, it's just touched me. And, and as far as questions, um, my agency, you know, we, we really advocate for the LGBTQ community. We um, are working really hard to, um, you know, acknowledge and respect and, you know, have just, you know, just really uh, be allies. And so when you shared your, your, um, your definition of allies, um, you know, part of me was like, I'm a white woman, a middle-aged woman uh, that has uh, family members that are of the LGBTQ community. Uh, and so I just want to understand. And when you said, you know, we don't just need empathy, you know, that's not what we really just need support. We need people to really get out there and work. And so our agency, I work for a foster family agency, um, a nonprofit, and we want to bring this information to our families, to families that want to foster youth. And that'll be the work that I'm doing. It, it, it will be that I am bringing your story and just, you know, information and education that I've learned about the, And so just thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I love, I love that, you know, I always, every time I go to do a, a, a talk or a workshop, I'm like, oh God, I hope that the way I'm conveying what I'm saying, I don't want to, my goal here is never to be like, you're horrible people, you need to be allies. I don't want you to walk away feeling like, oh my God, I haven't been doing enough, but I do want you to walk away feeling like you wanna do more. Or if you haven't been doing anything that you want to now, that's the purpose of me sharing uh, my, my stories um, you know, with you guys. I, I had a quick question for Tracy or whomever. Um, I, there's a lot of questions here that I would like to at least type the answers to. Is there a way to keep these up so that I can answer them? Because they're good questions. And I know we don't have the time, but I really want to answer them at least in the chat, you know? Yeah, definitely. We can, okay. we can post the questions from the Q&A and feel free to, to respond in the chat. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kaden. They are, Absolutely. thank you for your time. Um, they are awesome questions and you have awesome experience to share with us. Um, for timing's sake, we must move on, but we're hoping to get some more of your questions at the end, um, especially with our fireside chat, um, which we would now like to introduce. Uh, this session is supposed to be more of an informal conversation rather than a formal Q&A, but we will be sharing some questions up on the screen that were created by community before the session. To start, we would love to hear your reflections from the presentations you just heard. Um, which you can post in the chat or the Q&A. Uh, for Achira and Kenya, thank you so much. Hello. Hey, King. Hey, how you doing? I'm good. I'm really happy to be here. Um, my name is Ajira. For everyone who doesn't know. Um, my pronouns are she, they, and I'm calling in today from Occupied Tongva Lens. I'm so happy to be here on my own behalf, as well as um, on behalf of Roots of Labor, Ooh, I'm pointing to the wrong side, Roots of Labor Birth Collective, um, which is a collective of um, BIQCQOC birth workers um, up in Oakland on Olone lands. <laughs> King, say hello to these people. Hello, greetings everybody. Um, it's good to see you at Jera, as always. Uh, my name is King, um, King Yam, and uh, always lowercase. My pronouns are they, them, and King. Um, I occupy any land where I feel safe in the moment, so that's right uh, right now. So thank you for having me in this space, and I look forward to this conversation. I'm looking at the reflections folks are sharing in the chat and I'm, I'm glad that so many people were touched and that folks are thinking about, you know, how can, how, how can they apply this information? Mm -hmm. um, which I know is something you're passionate about as well. Yeah, most definitely. I think that the first question or the first um, invitation was to, um, to share our reflections on, um, 
yeah, the very powerful conversation that um, Kaden had with us. It's the first time that I've been in space with Kaden and Kaden is pure awesomeness. So um, it is really a privilege to be in, in space with him. And I'm glad that there's been, um, that there are a lot of people who are registered and I know that people will be watching the recording. And I think that it is, as Kaden shared, that uh, the erasure of Black trans experience in reproductive um, spaces um, is something that we need to address. And yeah, <laughs> Kaden dropped some things, um, but also Kaden is very humble. <laughs> so um, one of the things that Kaden has not shared um, directly was how much that Kaden has shared of his experience while he was pregnant. I followed mostly from uh, when he was pregnant with Journey. Um, not just, um, not just their experience with just like the pregnancy, but life in general as a trans um, man, a gay trans man, right? Um, at the same time, I will name what is not being, <laughs> what uh, Kaden was, was uh, too humble to, to name, that at the same time, there was another white trans person who was a uh, trans man who was pregnant at the same time. And the ways in which um, social media has not given Caden um, the amount of attention that this other white trans man who shares stories about, and you know, if you know who I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about, right? But they share stories about being on a farm and about their goat. Um, fine, <laughs> right? Uh, Caden has a full ass life, all right? Oh yeah, people, people are ready, Caden, <laughs> right? as a full ass life, right? Kaden has shared their experience as a black trans gay man um, with their relationship with their, um, their, um, their first child, their relationship and in a gay relationship, um, the amount of bullshit that they had to experience with um, microaggressions, just in the, in the overall world, in addition to their pregnancy, right? And even now, so I'm really appreciative of, of, of Kaden and the, the space that, that he takes and recognizing that we need more voices, right? And we need to hear more about the experiences and recognizing that not everybody has the protection that white trans men have. And by that, I mean that Kaden's page can be shut down. Um, Nobody really wants to hear what about our about our black trans experience, trans mass experience, or black trans people, period, um, or black people, you know, experiences, right? And um, as much as Caden shares about their life on, on uh, social media, I believe that Caden also uses their page as a teaching tool, right? So people are good to watch, you know, videos of people dancing, right? or um, the cuteness, which is their baby, um, their babies, right? But also Caden is, puts themselves out there that somebody can shut them down, right? Which is, which is how they use their page to, you know, for business, right? How they make their, their bread and butter, right? These are not the things that um, white trans um, men have to experience in the same ways, right? So, but anyways, um, I know that our conversation is more around um, in, um, centering birth, but I want to put out that this, it is reproductive. It is reproductive health, is reproductive justice, and a part of having, um, <laughs> you're going to have to jump in. Kaden, jump in, right? <laughs> jump in. I don't know if there's space for that, but I mean, there should be. Um, that, um, I'm not too sure what I was saying just now, but <laughs> um, yeah, you, you remind me what I was talking about. <laughs> Well, I <laughs> I got excited. I got excited and distracted too. And Kaden, please, you're yeah. welcome to join us. Uh, we're absolutely I, open. To I that. was over here um, answering my my questions, and I whoever I haven't responded to, I will respond. I promise. Um, so, uh, you know, King. Okay, 
So since we're, since we're going, let's go. Um, <laughs> um, I did. I didn't know if you were gonna catch the farm reference, but you did, that's cool. Um, <laughs> um, I, do I don't like talking about that type of stuff because you know, my, my goal with my platform is not to gain father followers. Um, so who we are talking about, because I'm not as humble as I seem, is we're talking about Danny, Danny Wakefield. I don't have a problem whatsoever with Danny at all. I've known Danny since Danny was the Manny and before the whole pregnancy thing. And in truth and honesty, I helped Danny navigate himself into the position that he's in currently. Um, he was contacting me during his pregnancy and basically asking how to get himself out there. And I was, you know, helping, you know, with that. What I did find, as King pointed out, is that Danny did not do anything that I did not do. But if you, if you take a look at Instagram, for example, um, I have a humble 34 K followers. Um, Danny, last I checked, was sitting at, I believe like 90,000 followers. Danny literally had, and I, I, I don't mean no harm. He's actually at a hundred K now. I don't know if you guys can see that because of my green screen. There we go. 100,000 followers. I have 34,000. Danny has done nothing but give birth. But because he's white, because he's white and he puts on this, I'm gonna be honest, it's very, I love Danny to death, but it's, it's very performative. But he puts on this, like, I'm just the sweetest person in the world. And oh, my baby, my baby, my baby. And people eat that shit up, excuse my French. And, you know, whereas for me, you know, I was literally used as a tool to <laughs> further the transphobic agenda by a political figure who was pardoned by Trump. And my family was paraded around my pregnancy, my pregnancy pictures, my pregnancy videos were used as this hate mongering campaign to call all um, trans people pedophiles and sexual deviants and things of that nature and to, to talk about how men can't have babies and we're abominations and all of these things. And the only time that um, white people rally around black trans masculine people such as myself is when it's to save me. And because they wanna eat up that trauma and they need to be that white savior. And that's just being honest with you. And then once they're done saving me, they unfollow me. But they will follow Danny to the end of the earth as he continues to share his story of, you know, how he used to be an addict and, and that's his plight, which I'm, you know, it's so dope that he's, you know, recovering and things of that nature. But Danny is not struggling in the least bit. Addict or not, he still has a full farm with goats and chickens and, and is always taking trips and lives up in the mountains in, in, in Oregon and is out here living his very best life. And not only that, as if it wasn't enough, he also now, <laughs> and I haven't said this out loud uh, since hearing about it, he also now provides workshops based off of his lived experience and is being flown out to different locations and paid to do exactly what I've been doing. But he's getting, I, I only found out about it because um, somebody was like, oh, your name was just dropped. Um, and I was like, where? Who, who was, oh, Danny was giving this training and it was so amazing. So he's out there providing D, E, and I, diversity, equity, inclusion training based off of his lived experience. And I just, 
So now I'm jumping. I'm, I'm, I, I did have a prior um, engagement, but King started talking and I'm like, I'm over here trying to type. My phone rang and I was like, no, I got to call you back <laughs> because yeah, it's something that I don't talk about because I am not in the, in the space of, you know, seeming like I'm bashing anybody. I'm not going to hate on anybody's, you know, um, success. You know, it's not his fault. He's white. Um, and Danny always, 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 what I will give him, he's, he always shares my stuff. He's always calling white people to action. He's always doing those things. Um, regardless of whether or not it's to gain his followers or whatever, he still does it, which is, I appreciate. Um, but I just wanted to, I felt like I wanted to expound on that because it really is the difference between what it means and what, what the black trans masculine experiences, even in medical spaces, birth and, and things of that nature, as opposed to the white um, experience. It's just white people are more palatable. Their stories are, are eaten up and, 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 you know, ours have to be trauma filled and are trauma filled. There's plenty of it. Um, so I just wanted to come and say that really quick. And, you know, I'll jump back in the chat. I'm going to I'm gonna let you guys keep chatting while I answer these questions, but I'm here now, I'm invested. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for jumping in. Um, I'm just gonna also add one of the things that you shared, which I think kind of ties in is um, being in an experience and like you said, being determined not to die, right? I don't know if anybody else has to worry about these things, right? And that is the that is a huge difference. So while um, yes, there might be a similarity in that in the fact of having you know given birth, right? There are some real, real, real things that we always have to think about. Am I going to actually live? And also, when um, Caden shared that there's a question around like your mental health, am I actually going to be able to bring my child home? Are you going to take my child from me? right? These are real, real concerns. So um, I don't know, I don't use the word microaggressions because these are macro um, fucked up shit that we have to deal with, right? Um, yeah, so that was one of the things. So I just wanted to, you know, that was my, that's my reflections <laughs> on uh, partially on, uh, on, on um, Caden's share. And um, also, just the mere fact, I, I don't know, remember the, I know that we're going to go into some other things around what it means to be an ally. Um, and as, as Caden shared, that it is not, it is not enough to, to be empathetic. It is not enough to, to think that you are and to name yourself as being an ally, right? Um, for example, one of the things, I did not know about this, this, this training that um, um, your friend or our friend <laughs> has been doing. Um, one of the things that when you are, you're stepping into your role of actively trying to deconstruct all of these systems that are oppressing, right? And I do not say that they're just oppressing myself or other um, people with shared identities and stuff. Once you have such an amount of oppression that we're all, what some of us or many of us are experiencing, it is oppressing all of us. And I don't know how many people realize that. Right, because the mere fact that you're somehow engaging in it, even by being an oppressor, right? What is it doing for you, and what is it doing for your insides and you know your whole entire body? And at some point, what, what are you going to do? Because at some point, someone's going to bring home somebody who looks like me, or you know what I mean? And then what? Right? Is that when you're going to decide that you're going to make some make some shifts, right, or not? Right? Um, so you're harming you're harming us all, right? Um, when you're stepping into this role of being um, a co-conspirator, um, then you will be passing on these opportunities. Why is it that you must do everything? Why must you have it all? Why are you not saying, hey, Caden, somebody contacted me to do this training. Why are we not doing that, right? So um, I'm not really out here like to, I'm not, it's not knocking down, it's a matter of like, what are you you're asking me? Like, what do you need to be doing? Right? How do you step up this game and how do you go into the space of being more uncomfortable? Right? Um, and here, there are many things that people can do because people already have a lot of comfort. How are you now redistributing 
your, um, your privileges, um, your access? How are you doing these things in meaningful ways that is not charitable? It is redistributing, it is reparation, it is making things, you know what I mean? It's atonement for, for many things, right? You know, your, your foreparents and that you're probably currently engaging in and benefiting. So, um, and those things, I talk about it as, as like a, as a, um, like as a big open thing, but these are things that you bring into, we're talking about specifically in this space about reproductive, uh, reproductive health, right? These are very, very applicable to what it is our topic today, right? So when you're training, like one of the things that I know that we're probably going to go into is what people can be doing. It's been said that there are people who are doing this training. There are people who are offering it. Caden offers courses. I offer courses. There are other people. I don't know if anybody else, but if there are, then pay people who are again um, who are um, who have these these um, identities, right? Um, and it is not enough to just um, follow. It's not enough to just share. It's not enough to whatever it is. Me, I don't know about Caden. I'm quite certain. We don't pay our bills with shares and likes, right? And going back again to not, um, not wanting to die or having these thoughts, we need to thrive. We all need to thrive, right? I'm not here just to, to not die. That's not something I ever think about. I'm not, I don't wake up in the morning and just try not to, to not die, right? That should be the experience that people are going into reproductive health spaces as well. It should not be to come out and not, you know, to not die or to not have the children taken away. How can this be the best experience like anybody else? If we're talking about giving birth, why can we not have the best experience giving birth? If it is to have an abortion, why can we not have the best humane, um, respectful experience having an abortion? Right, so I think there were some other questions. Oh, here are some other prompts for us to get into. If I may touch on um, or expand on just, I really resonated with what you were just saying, King, about folks not having as like the, the ultimate goal is to just survive the experience, but to have, you know, a goal of having the best experience. And I, I, I want people to have like as reverent, as connected, as expansive or, you know, contained an experience as they want, an experience that's directed by the person who is giving birth and nobody else. And for that to be something that's afforded to everyone without exception. Um, and it doesn't seem like a lot to ask. And I think um, something that I saw a few people ask in the chat and also in the Q&A box is, is how can birth workers, um, you know, support queer and trans birthing people better? And I, I want to say before I, 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 I hope that you will answer this as well is that I think we have to look beyond like learning pronouns. Pronouns are literally the minimum. <laughs> Like, if you're not going to do more than that, maybe don't even bother doing that. <laughs> like, um, you know, don't don't give anybody any like um, illusion of uh, an awareness or an investment or a sense of, you know, um, yeah, a willing a sense of a willingness to actually engage with the lived experiences of people outside of your own. And um, I think it sometimes starts to feel exhausting to just think about like how the, the main ask is to just listen and learn. Thank you so much, everyone. We are coming to a close, but on that note of um, sort of this, almost an, an ask in that action and thinking about allyship as a verb. Um, how can we as providers, as birth workers, um, 
ensure that we are giving each person their definition of an empowered birthing experience and a safe birthing experience. Is that me? <laughs> um, I think that it's always best just to ask, right? Like, I think that for whatever part of our experiences, I think that, I mean, it's like sex. If you know what I mean? It's like anything else. What would make this an, an empowering? What would make this a beautiful experience for you, right? And listening for that and of sitting here and being attentive to this individual, not bringing in all the other things that you might think about this person, right? But listening to what it is that they are saying that they need, what their concerns are, what are they afraid of, you know? Um, and then we being responsive around that, right? Um, maybe it could be around, um, I'm, I'm terrified that they're not going to respect my partners, right? You listen to that, right? Um, and then I'll also tell you, like, if it's going to be what, if a birthing, it's going to be in a, um, a hospital or a birthing center like that, that might tell you as a birth worker how you're going to engage with the people, the staff there, but it also tells you as a birth worker to make sure that you're giving attention to the, um, the, the supporting the other partners who are also here along this journey to make sure that it is an amazing experience for them as well, right? So I think asking and understanding and not making any assumptions, right? And, and then going forward and also clarifying some things as well, right? Like maybe, you know, they might share um, partners, maybe then you're going to say, okay, um, is there anything about your partners that I kind of need to know, right? Now, what are your pronouns about your partners, your partner's names? Um, what are their roles? What are the roles that they want to play in this, in your birthing experience, right? It's a great time to also maybe say, you know, would it be, you know, useful if we all met, if I got to meet them and they got to meet me and maybe they get to share, right? Asking questions, listening, um, and also just seeing that person as an individual, right? Um, because sometimes you might make assumptions. Maybe you might see me and you might start making assumptions about all this trauma and blah, 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 right? But maybe I had a previous beautiful um, birthing experience before, right? But you're, you know, you may, you might have jumped to all these conclusions. Me, I also want this one to also be a beautiful birthing experience, right? And I deserve it, right? Without question, right? So what could I also do to make sure that this one is also? So um, also, just like I said, just not making any assumptions at all. Can I add one more thing? Um, like being open to and uh, op being open to being corrected without centering yourself. So if somebody tells you like, don't, it doesn't matter what the last person that you asked this question to told you was the correct whatever's of whatever's, this person is telling you that this is what they want. So, okay, thank you, got it. That's it. And if you fuck it up, sorry, let me just repeat that for myself, got it. Okay, you know, there's no, it, you don't need to like, yeah, you don't need to like bring your whole, you know, it, experience into the, into the mix because it's not about you. It's not your birth. That is so simple and elegant and doable. And thank you so much. Um, thank you for your wisdom. So we are at our closing. Um, I wanna thank everyone for all of the questions you asked, the amazing comments in the chat, and for joining this October's Collaboratory. Uh, we hope that you will join us next month to honor World Prematurity Day on November 17th at our event titled, Let's Talk About Preterm Birth. Join us virtually at a transformative community open mic and resource fair with giveaways, including Golden State Warriors and Trevor Noah tickets. Um, all are welcome, especially black and brown families. Hear from families like yours, celebrate healing and survival, and gain new knowledge to advocate for just births. You can RSVP at the, that little link here on the screen or use the QR code, um, and we will also be posting that information in the chat. Uh, just a final thank you to all of our panelists, all of our speakers. I personally admire all of you so much, and this is, um, I am so grateful for this experience. Thank you so much. And thank you all. Thanks to all of you for coming. Yeah. Okay. <laughs>